say Merry Christmas. We're going to stand and sing our final words. Go turn it on the mountain. Let's sing the first part. <laughs> today so glad for those of you that are here it's a blessing that you're here it means so much but we also welcome those of you that are watching online uh you know with these covid days it just feels like i don't know if you can say we take three steps forward and two steps back or two back you know whatever it looks like it's it's just a mess and i know that it's coming into consideration now once again people deciding what activities they're going to do or not do and uh, I appreciate those decisions and choices and it makes me all the more appreciative of those of you that are here today uh, to worship the Lord as well but we welcome each person today uh, our flowers today aren't they beautiful it was so wonderful that they were here uh, even for our Christmas Eve service uh, our poinsettia is oh man that was a mess most of them died uh there are a few left if you paid for one there's a there were a few that are still left back there and you're welcome to get one of those uh i would tell you i would go to brookshire's if you bought one and don't get one i'd go to brookshire's but i can tell you i bought brookshire's out pretty much as we were replacing them over the course of the month and the last ones i went and got brookshire's were about half dead but they were better than our dead ones here. So I bought those and we just limped to the finish line kind of with our poinsettias. But it makes me all the more appreciative of our beautiful flowers. They're given by Francis Ann Boddicker uh, in loving memory of Hart and Faye Woods anniversary. That's going to be January the 1st. How many of you all know uh, Francis Boddicker? How many of you know her? Hey, I want to ask you because uh, isn't she in Dallas? Isn't she in Dallas? I, that's what I think and and so I don't think she'll ever see these flowers so if you would let her know thank you and just check in that would be really great because she is very gracious in our church in so many ways staying connected with us and doing things for us even though she's in Dallas and I, I would bet these are some of her parents or you know like that it's awesome and, and their anniversary is January the 1st. I was thinking, that's a smart man, getting married on January the 1st, because you can always remember your anniversary. But I say that, too, because I ask you to pray for my mom, because tomorrow it would be my parents' anniversary. So it'll be the first one you know since his passing, and I know that's going to be a hard day uh, for, for my mom. I would also tell you that uh, Mark Stewart, over the recent months, has kept us surprised and asked us to pray for Janetta Stewart. Uh, she was once a member of the church and sad to report that she passed this past Monday. And so we now are praying for the family and we so appreciate Mark keeping us up to date on that. And so uh, those things have been going on to let you know. You know, we've had some busy weeks at the church, but this week is going to be kind of slow, uh, except that we will have Celebrate Recovery on Tuesday night. Uh, Celebrate Recovery starts at 6 uh, and there's a meal and then at seven move into the sanctuary for worship you know it's so important to keep this ministry going during the holidays because the holidays can be very challenging on some of these fronts and even this past tuesday there were five first-time people to celebrate recovery 
this past Tuesday. So it's a really awesome and viable ministry, and I encourage you to keep it in your prayers. And every one of us have hurts, habits, and hangups that we're dealing with. Uh, I get blessed by the lessons and by the worship, and so we just encourage you and always please keep that in your prayers. Church office is going to be closed on Friday, right before New Year's, and it'll be closed on Monday, January the 3rd as well, uh, all in observance of the new year that'll be happening next next week. Uh, any other announcements we need to make today? Uh, if there are no other announcements, we're going to continue in worship by standing and join together in song. Let's stand to sing. I was finishing a minute ago it's like I know I'm forgetting something I'm looking at my notes I can't think what it is but what it is is I want to light the advent wreath again today just because it's interesting that we only get to light the Christ candle like at the Christmas Eve service and today it was interesting people coming in I want to say Merry Christmas but it's kind of after you know but it is like still it's Christmas and to celebrate that I also want to do it because I love 
acknowledging what the candles are about because those are gifts that God has given to us in Jesus uh, and they're a reminder of that and that's going to be something we look at the infinite resources of God so our first candle in the Advent candle is the candle of joy we've had some struggles this week remembering that this one that's funny to me the second one is the candle of peace. If you were here at the first service on Christmas Eve, our helper was really onto the candle of hope. They were all hope, basically. So what is our third candle? The candle of hope. Our hope is in Jesus. Thanks be to God. And then wonderful, the candle of love. And then on Christmas Eve, we get to light the Christ candle, which for us also symbolizes light, because Jesus is the light of the world. And the, the, the candlelight service is just such a beautiful time, so powerful in those services on Christmas Eve, as we all light our candle from the Christ candle, uh, what a glorious time and service services though were those were on Christmas Eve. So we want to light those candles again today, and we want to do that because we're praying these candles make it through the service. They uh, are, yeah, glory to God. That'll be good uh, if they do. What are our joys and our concerns today? Preston, did Santa Claus show up? Did you get, get anything worth it? JJ, you get anything? Hey, dudes. <laughs> hey, dudes. All right. Hey, I enjoyed seeing y'all. Y'all have had a kind of a great week, a good week. Like, y'all had a great Christmas week. I love that. Uh, I'm seeing that. I've been sharing that journey and soaking that in. So, Merry Christmas. Oh man, so Debbie and I are supposed to travel this afternoon and I've had lots of people on the road today. So travel mercies for all of those that are on the road uh, today. Uh, William too was earlier sharing that his father, like 83 years old, is out driving today and that him getting from one place to the other is an issue, much less the safety on the road. So <clears throat> we do pray for travel mercies for any that are traveling today or in these days. Yes. Other joys or concerns? I just hope you had a wonderful Merry Christmas. Debbie and I just what a blessed Christmas. So thankful uh, for that. Uh, I want to say too, church, church-wise, just for us to be thankful to God for the financial provision that would have, you know, the church with COVID and everything, the church has had a really great year financially. So can you say amen? That is quite the blessing. We know that you know maybe in times past struggles, but thankful for what God has done, the things we've been able to do. And then next year is going to be just a big year for some things we're going to attempt and see. So we're praying for God's provision. Uh, we serve an awesome God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Lord, we come today with grateful hearts. Lord, so thankful for the Christmas season. Jesus is the reason for the season that there would be more Christ in our Christmas, Father God, more Jesus in our lives, Father. And thank you for the way you love us and what you have done for us in Jesus. Lord, uh, I pray for each family, your blessings over each life and each family, uh, that they can have a sense of your grace, your presence, your provision into their family, Father God. And uh, Lord, I I thank you for the way that you have provided for this church. I thank you for the faithfulness of the congregation as well, financially and in, and in attendance and other ways. Lord, you are at work in our midst, and we give you thanks and praise for that. Certainly, Lord, we lift up our world. Uh, so many places where we see just issues and, and tribulation and strife, and we pray for peace on earth, Father God. Lord, we pray for our nation. 
We pray for the leaders of our nation and we lift them up and we pray for harmony and unity within the land that we would be one nation under God, indivisible, and that there would be liberty and justice for all. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Lord, in our families, I know probably each and every one of us have specific you know, concerns and issues within our families, Father God, and you know the burdens, uh, the prayers of our hearts and uh, that we could see you at work uh, in our families as we see you at work in other places as well, Lord God. Lord, hear our prayers today. Thank you for this family of faith, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that your Spirit is at work among us. Hear us now as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For nine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Now would normally be the time we take up the offering, but as we've gone into COVID, we've settled on doing it in the basket at the back for those that are here. And God has really been, you know, again, providing for us in that. Those watching online, there's ways to give online or you can mail in your checks, as many do. And we're so thankful for your faithfulness and for God's provision in these ways. Two projects we're looking at right now is trying to finish that parking lot, getting it sealed and everything, and that's about $3,600. We're also going to, if you've seen Jeter Hall, we're going to do that to the hallways upstairs, and that's about $1,000. So we're working to get those things in place to do those things. Uh, but just so thankful for your faithfulness and God's faithfulness to us. Let's stand and give praise to God from whom all blessings flow. Uh, born and raised in East Texas. I was born and raised a Dallas Cowboy fan. I don't know if those two go together. But I know that when I started preaching, one of the challenges was that whenever the Cowboys play, you better be done before kickoff, okay? And so I want to tell you what's really awesome is I should be done today before kickoff. 7.20. 7.20 tonight is kickoff, and I think I should be done before 7.20 tonight. So glory to God. Glad that you're here. Buckle your seatbelts. Uh, the stewardesses will be around shortly with drinks and for, for refreshments. Uh, and we'll make it home before Cowboys kick off tonight. Uh, I am a planner, okay? And, and I enjoy like, planning trips. I think about my life and, and plan 
my life on things. And so the end of year is always an interesting time for me to assess. Uh, one of the ways to assess is thinking, where have I been? Okay. And, and that, that, if you've never done it before, that can go back all the way into your childhood even. Uh, I'm doing a men's retreat in January, and, and there's a group of men that we do this type of assessment, and we do what's called a spiritual summary. So doing a spiritual summary of 2021, but because we do them every year, when I look at where I've been, I don't have to go back like to my childhood. I'm just looking back at the past year. But where have I been? Then assessing kind of where am I at right now? Uh, you ever go to the mall and you go look, you find that you are here thing, you know, like to you're not sure where the store you want to go to is. So you go that you are here to figure out where you're going to go. So where you've been, where you're at, that you are here. And then to prayerfully discern where am I going? And so in our men's retreat, one of the things that we do is we set goals like for the year, for the coming year. I have about 10 or 12 goals. Uh, that are important to me for the coming year. I share them with a small group at the men's retreat. I share that with them, and, and they share their goals with me. And we pray for each other. We hold each other accountable uh, for our goals. I will tell you, I had three primary goals for this year, and I bombed on two of them. I mean, bombed on two of them. So I'm not really excited you know, about going and reporting. Yep, just totally crashed and burned on those two. But we assess that and then want to try to do better in this coming year and they pray for me when I meet with those guys it's hard when they ask me how are you doing and on one of them I can say I'm doing okay and the other two it's like helping Jesus and wanting to do better this year but also in that is to take a spiritual assessment okay to take a spiritual assessment it's wild to me to think I've been in ministry over 40 years okay uh I first took a youth pastor position when I was 19 years old. Uh, I think I got hired more because I played softball than for anything I could do for the youth group. The church had a young men's softball team that I don't even know how many of them actually went to the church. And they were very competitive. And, and the pastor wanted to try to reach some of those guys. So in the interview, he asked me if I played softball. And I said yes. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> on all the church softball teams I ever played on, they gave you a shirt and a cap. Okay? And so he comes to me after I was hired, and he brings me this professional uniform. And he says, they play Thursday night. Come, and I'll take you there and introduce them, and I'm going to tell them that you're going to play. And so I showed up on Thursday night dressed in this professional softball uniform and the guys were way less than happy that I was going to be playing with them because they were very, I mean very competitive and were in tournaments almost every weekend. So my first position in ministry, I did some youth work, but mostly I was playing softball all summer and I will say I got to preach at the end of the summer and the whole softball team and it may have been some of the only time a lot of those guys went to church the whole year. And we had to draw maps for some of them how to find the church that they were supposed to be playing for. Such is the deal of church sports. But I started at ministry at 19 years old uh, and have been in ministry these years. And, and a part of that is thinking like a spiritual assessment. How do you do some spiritual assessments? And this is one tool I placed uh, in your hand one possible tool uh, as I've worked with people and looked at people. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture about examining ourselves. The first one is in Lamentation, the third chapter, verse 40 and 41. But this verse is used by Celebrate Recovery when they talk about making a self-examination, assessing yourself. That's a part of the Celebrate Recovery journey. And, and so this verse here, Lamentations 340, is used in Celebrate Recovery, and then I'm going to add verse 41. Lamentations 340 says, Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Verse 41, Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. 
The verse I have tended to use about examining ourselves is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And this has been the verse I've tended to use all the years for this. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? The key there is examine yourselves. And so today I'm putting this handout in your hand and I'm kind of going to walk us through it as a way for you to think about examining yourself to where, see where you're at. I'm going to talk about patterns or categories. What I find is that I kind of slide around on this. I don't like, and I think that's true for most people, and just fall into just one place is that they kind of slide around. The first category that we're going to talk about uh, is people that are lost and they don't know they're lost and very sadly they don't care. They're just a careless sinner. And I want you to know that numerically this is the biggest category by far. This is the biggest category. You ever watch movies like, you know, like go to the movies or you watch a movie on TV how often in the movies do they talk about God or church? Hardly ever. <clears throat> and that is symbolic of our culture and our world. Okay? And is that, that people, they don't go to church, they don't care about church, they don't care about God, they're just living their lives and, and going on. We live in the Bible Belt and so sometimes more people go to church than, than, you know, than that. But, but sometimes, I mean, you know, just this is a big category in our world. There's a prayer that, that I like to pray that, that says, Father God, break my heart with what breaks yours. If you want to pray a dangerous prayer, pray that prayer. But I will tell you, one of the things that breaks God's heart is how many people are in this category right here that God and church just really aren't even on their radar, on their screen at all. And they're just lost and living their lives. Okay? The second pattern or category is lost, but they're becoming aware that they are lost. This is a fascinating category because a lot of times they're beginning to be convicted by God and they're the ones that you'll say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? I'll say, I don't want to go to church. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. I don't want to, you know, and man, if you mention God or church, it likes pushing a button and you get some big response, okay? And what I have learned is most often that's because God is working in their lives and they're beginning to feel convicted and they're fighting that conviction. And a lot of times it, with that person, you just start praying for them because they're fixing to have a life change when they start getting radical, when you start talking about church or God. Uh, and, and so they're lost, but they're beginning to get convicted. They're beginning to become aware of that they're lost. And quite often they have some big responses to things because they're beginning to feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. I uh, have enjoyed Pastor's Discipleship Bible Study at a level. It's also been very frustrating to me because we only have a few people that ever come. And so I don't know if we're going to keep going. But it helps me in preaching. And, and on this sheet, uh, Mary Ann challenged me about our, my categories. And I had to redraw the whole sheet and add this next category. But it makes total sense to me what she said. And that's why I like having pastor's Bible study is because it helps me in my preaching. But in this third category, this third pattern, is somebody that's lost and sadly they're deceived. Because in their deception, they probably don't know that they're lost. They believe in God. They believe in God. And here's what's really bizarre. They may even attend church. Sometimes they attend church regularly there's a good chance that they may be baptized. But they're, and then they're also living a moral life. They're trying to do good. They're doing good things and trying to be good enough. They often compare themselves to other people, like you know, somebody that you know, 
got put in jail or their own drugs or that happened in their family and they find ways to compare themselves to people so that they in their own mind look okay but if you ask them if they're go if, if you ask them if they're going to heaven they would for sure say yes but why and it would be because I'm good and they would they're going to give you some version of I'm good enough that I deserve to go to heaven and I want to tell you, churches, there's a lot of people sitting in pews in this category that think they're going to heaven because they're being good enough and they're better than most people. And they're lost. That kind of hurts, doesn't it? The person that was speaking to me about this even said that was somebody they're dearly loved, they felt fell into that category in their lives. And just because... What makes us saved? Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Why are you going to heaven? Because I'm forgiven. Because of the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That's why I'm going to heaven. And that's what gets you into heaven. So you see the cross there, right? You see lost there to the left. And now everything on the other side says saved. And I want you to know that that, that, that little difference between those two categories, category three and category four, is just a very small difference. But it's difference between lost and saved. And that's pretty significant. <laughs> Eternally significant. Because the person on the saved side understands that they're saved because of the blood of Jesus and by their faith in Christ and what God has done for us in Jesus. While that person on the other side is still thinking, I'm going to be good enough and that's why I deserve to get in. And so the, the fourth category, well, let me, let me talk about those three categories on that lost side. A common, a common denominator in all of those categories and patterns is they're selfish they're living self-focused and self-directed lives. For us as human beings, our default nature, our default nature is sinful and selfish. And if you're lost, that's where you're at. You haven't, it, you really can't deliver yourself out of that, even though you can do good things and everything like that. It's still a sinful, selfish base of under everything. Fourth pattern, fourth category moves over to the saved side. It moves over to the saved side. And now the, the, the being saved is an awesome thing. Forgiven, born again, new life in Jesus, eternal life in Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, uh, enabled by the Holy Spirit. It's a whole new world when you're saved. And so, so to move over to the safe side, born again, forgiven, sealed by the Holy Spirit, going to church, but in this category, this fourth category, going to church, but with little or no heart or life change, with little or no transformation in their thoughts, in their language, in their actions, they're saved, but there's very little fruit. And they're living a lot like the world, a lot like the people on that other side. But their faith is what? In Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And in that, they're saved. Because we're saved by faith, not by our works. I'm at the men's retreat. I'm working on my teachings for the two men's retreats I'm going to be a part of and it's about being a wise master builder and you always hear me talk about 1 Corinthians 3 lay the foundation of Jesus but then every day we're building on that foundation with gold and silver and precious stones or with wood, hay or stubble this person's doing a lot of building with wood, hay or stubble and, and, and so they're saved because they understand it's by the blood of Jesus and faith in Him but there's little life change, little transformation, not a whole lot of fruit. Okay? Now, these next three categories kind of shift exponentially. Okay? I would like to think, I would like to think that I tend to live shifting between five and six. Okay? Very seldom break over into seven, but, but quite often shift in between five and six. 
maybe sometimes even sliding back down into category four. <laughs> yes, and the Holy Spirit is quick to convict when I can feel myself going there and, and try to then respond appropriately. But I feel like I live most time in five and six, very seldom touching up into seven, but trying to be in five and six. And that's just, you know, I, I may be deceived in that, but that, that's what I think. The fifth pattern is saved and born again, forgiven, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And they've invited God into their hearts. They've invited God into their lives. They've invited God into their plans. They've invited God into their dreams. But it's still their plan, their dreams. And now God's going to help me. He's going to help me fulfill the plans and dreams that I have. And I want you to know I'm a planner. <laughs> And God is for me. He's not against me. He's a good, good father. And I too often can draw him into my plans, my dreams, and want it my way. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and, and so uh, I love teaching our children, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And, and I want them to know that God has plans for their lives. But quite often then that draws them into this mindset of God in my plans or into level six. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but, but it's like God is with me in my plans and my dreams. And me, be a plan, me being a planner, I can tell you that this would be too often where I naturally fall and I have to think about it to try to let God by His Holy Spirit move me forward into the next level. Because the, the sixth category, the sixth pattern, is saved and born again, forgiven, sealed by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and here's a key, surrendered their hearts and lives to God and surrendered their plans to Him. So they are surrendered. They are surrendered to His purposes for their for their lives. Okay, and it's a, it's a subtle thing, but but it's but it's important to note because they've surrendered to God's plans for their lives. God had, God put a call on me to be a preacher. Okay, and so I had to surrender. I, I would have thought about being a garbage collector. A painter, a lawyer, or in advertising. Like if I was planning my life, I probably would have gone one of those ways. Hopefully toward a lawyer or an advertiser. <laughs> but I would have thought that way, but God called me to be a pastor. And so that became like his plan for my, my life. But, but like it's still my life. Okay. And trying to follow God's plan with my life for my life but it's still kind of about me okay and that's when I'm doing better like his plan for my life living on that side but it's still my life rather than my plan for my life my ideas God help me be the best lawyer I can be help me be the best advertiser I can be you know and help God helping me do this now I'm over he has plans for our lives Lord I'm in your plan but it's still my life and, and I'm, but I'm trying to surrender to your plans for my life, not inviting you into my plans, but I'm surrendered to your plans. Subtle difference, but a big difference, okay? I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. If you're interested and you're serious, taking this seriously, the Holy Spirit will help you see the distinctions. I'm not saying it's the final word on things. And even already, like somebody showed me that there should be another category on the page. I understand that. Now we come to the seventh pattern or category, okay? And I want you to know when we get to the seventh pattern, we're in some pretty deep waters. All right? There are very few people that live in category seven. Uh, and, 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 it, and that's because it's just a whole different deal. I want you to know when I think of category seven, I've, I may have mentioned that one, Jan, Corbin, Jan Corbin's granddaughter to me would fall probably, I've never met her, but I think that she would probably fall in category seven. And her story, Jan's granddaughter, reminds me of this young woman I know. She's six foot eight. 
and she's white. And God called her as a missionary to Niger, Africa. I want you to know that she stands out everywhere she goes. She stands out. I was blessed to go to Nigeria uh, on a mission trip. And I have to tell you that when I went to Nigeria, I figured that, you know, like in the United States, I, it, it, you know, I loved going to Wesley McKay because Wesley McKay was a blended congregation. Have you ever heard that saying that the most segregated hour in our nation is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning? Have you ever heard that? Okay. And so, I mean, you know, like here we sit, all white. Okay. So I love going to Wesley McCabe where it was a blended congregation. I anticipated when I went to Nigeria that there would probably, you know, like I live in a world, I live in a world, my world, but it's more white and then there's some, you know, black people. Okay. If you go over on Southside Longview, that world, there's more black people <laughs> and some white people. So that's kind of what I was figuring Nigeria was going to be. Well, in Lagos, the capital of Nigeria, that's kind of how it is. But I want you to know, when we left Lagos, out of Lagos, I saw one other white person. One. I saw, because people live outdoors and things like that, I saw ten to 20,000 people. And I saw one white person. The little kids... Uh, we would go into places and little kids had never seen a white person before. They would come up and they would want to touch you because they wondered if it peeled off or something. And I say peeled off because their name for us was Oebo. Oebo, Oebo. And they would come running like just to stare at you, you know, or look at you or want to touch you. And Oebo, it's funny, Oebo means peeled one. And I don't know if you've ever seen a black person get cut. Have you ever seen that? That right inside the cut, the first layer is pink. And so we were the peeled ones. And so this young woman, we, I was just there for like 14 or 19 days and experiencing that. This young woman lives in that world because God has called her to go to Niger. They actually had to leave Niger uh, because it's Muslim and with COVID and a lot of stuff, she had to leave Niger and she's now in Nigeria, which is close neighboring by, but it's a very different, very different political religious situation in Nigeria. Although in Nigeria, there's incredible tension between the Christians and the Muslims, but there's both. In Niger, it's just primarily Muslim. You're six foot eight, you're white. Why are you here? And you can't say, I'm here as a missionary, or you could be killed. And you're risking your life because they could figure out, oh, you're not here to teach school to our kids. Oh, you're not here, you know, you're here to bring Christianity to our Muslim country and either kick you out or kill you. And, and that's her. So this category seven is somebody that's born again, forgiven. Sealed by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but they have surrendered to God and to His purposes. Not His purposes for their lives, but His purposes. What are some of the purposes of God? To seek and save the lost. What are some of the purposes of God? Making disciples. Caring for orphans. Caring for orphans. A friend of mine is Tom Helmuth. And when I first met Tom, Tom was the head of the engineering department at Letourneau. Engineering at Letourneau. Anybody know about engineering at Letourneau? That's what Letourneau is known for. And he was head of the engineering department. But God began to stir he and his wife's heart toward orphans. So they ended up adopting two street children from Columbia. Okay? And that was a, a major journey and adventure just even doing that. But even after they had finally got the kids acclimated, kind of functioning at a level in our American culture and our society, they still had a burden for orphans. And now they are in El Paso and across the border working at Ranchos Los Amigos, which is an orphanage there in Mexico. And he resigned from being the head of 
the, de the engineering department at Letourneau to go raise his support to care for orphans because orphans are on God's heart. Caring for widows involved in missions, seeking to stop human trafficking. I hope for us as a church that we're aware of the tragedy of human trafficking in our world today. There are over 27 million people that are human trafficked in our world. And that is enslaved beyond their choice to be involved in some kind of trafficking. And a whole lot of it is sexual trafficking. And did you know every year around the Super Bowl is one of the most horrific, biggest human trafficking events that happens every year around wherever the Super Bowl is going to be. And to raise awareness of human trafficking and how can we involve in seeing it and recognizing it and stopping human trafficking. It is huge. And I would just encourage you to, to learn more about that. God is for stopping human trafficking. And, and we need to raise our awareness and how can we be a part of that. And there are people that are giving their lives to stopping human trafficking. 13-year-old girl that has to service 70 to 90 men a, men a day in a country where she had never heard about God, but somebody slipped her a Bible and she began to read Psalm 27 and she wrote it on the wall. And if you ever get a chance to read Psalm 27. And there's a gentleman named Gary Haugen, International Justice League. He worked for the government. He left working for the government when he discovered the, the magnitude of human trafficking. He founded the International Justice League. And they are involved in, the, in particularly European countries helping go in and rescue girls that have been sold into this quite often by their parents. So this 13-year-old girl, 70 to 90 people a day, but had found Psalm 27 and written it on her wall. And he was a part of going into her room to let her know that she was being set free. And he saw that and asked her. And he realized that God had sent him there to rescue her because of her prayer and writing that on the wall. And he brought that girl to his home in the United States to meet his 13-year-old daughter that had lived a very different life. And to try to begin that young woman on a different journey, set free from what she was trapped in and enslaved in. And these are stories of our day, people. 27 million people in human trafficking. And, the, and then you can read Luke 4, 18 through 19. And to know that he talks about setting the captives free. And you see the purposes of God. And there are people, glory to God, who have surrendered their lives to go after whatever the purposes of God are as revealed like in, in that thing and, uh, in Luke 4, 19 through 20. So these last three categories, those last three categories are seeking to be disciples of Jesus. They've encountered God and they are encountering God and His love and His grace and His power and His presence on a regular basis. In the book of Job, Job, all through the book of Job, Job is crying out because he feels like he's been done wrong and he wants to take his case to God. He wants God to come. I want to plead my case to God. And so as his friends are giving him this lame advice all through the book of Job, he continues to cry out, I want to meet God until all of a sudden God shows up. <laughs> And Job isn't so sure he wanted to meet God after all when God shows up. Because all of a sudden God is way bigger in everything than he ever imagined. And Job says, I've heard of you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. And we have so many people who have grown up in church hearing about God and hearing about God and hearing about God, but they have never encountered or experienced Him in His presence. And that's one of the things that makes Emmaus Walk so powerful is because Emmaus Walk is something where people can go and they can encounter God. I like to take our youth and children to camps and to conferences where they can encounter God and experience God and know this is what church is about. Sometimes the young people come home and they have trouble seeing what we do on Sunday and thinking how does that relate to encountering this awesome powerful God and we're over here doing this thing that doesn't make sense to me because God is way bigger than this. 
And so I pray for you in your heart that you have encountered God and that you learn through the spiritual disciplines of, of life, you can learn to encounter God more deeply and even see God in a sunset or in a sunrise or the hug of a child and to encounter God through His Word, to encounter God in prayer, to encounter God in worship, and that we, we want to live our lives encountering God on a regular basis. Hello, church? But too many times we, we come to a faith or we have a moment, then we drift off into mediocrity or lukewarmness and just read Revelation in the past week where God says, because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And our children, our youth, don't want any part of that lukewarm, mediocre. If that's what that is and there's no transformation, we want to encounter God, the living God. And when they encounter Him, it stirs a faith within them that's vibrant, that can be passed on, that means something in their lives. And so for us, we have to examine ourselves on this thing and think, where am I on this page? And am I living over in these places? And, and, and what do I need to do to keep the fire alive and to keep pressing into God and to be in who God's calling me to be and to be about His work? I told you about Tom Helmuth. I didn't mention Legend Oaks. It's just been awesome, the, the things that go to Legend Oaks. Well, Tom and Connie started sending to our church, Crossroads, here in Longview. The kids would make uh, cards that had their picture on it and what gifts they wanted for Christmas, kind of like Legend Oaks. And, and so one year, Debbie and I went and picked a card. Jasmine Betancourt, 13 or 14 years old, and, and, and we bought the stuff, you know, and put it in the box and it got shipped. So the next year they set the tree up again. And so we picked Jasmine Betancourt again because I'd been praying for her. I had her card and, and we sent it again. And I kept that on my desk and I would pray for Jasmine until one summer we were getting ready to do something. And, and I thought, man, it would be awesome to bring Jasmine to go to this conference that we're going to. I don't know what her experiences have been. And then we're going to go to Guatemala, and she could go with us to Guatemala. She's bilingual. She speaks English and Spanish. And Guatemala would be an awesome thing. So I sent to Tom and Connie, hey, would it be strange for us to help Jasmine get her visa? Visas, man, visas. I never understood visas till we started working in Costa Rica. I didn't know that they had to have visas. We don't have to have visas to go there, but they have to have visas to come here, and they're very expensive, and most people can't afford them. So that's why they try to come illegally, because visas are a whole process. I said, could we get a visa for Jasmine, try to get a visa for Jasmine, and see if she could come here to the United States, visit Debbie and I, go with us to the conference, go with us to Guatemala, and she's going to be with us six weeks and she doesn't know us. <laughs> Bless Jasmine, right? So they asked her if she wanted to do that. She said yes. We sent the money down to apply for her visa, and glory to God, she got her visa. She got to come to the United States. As she was with us over those six weeks in the United States, there was a couple on the East Coast that had sponsored Jasmine since she was seven years old. And they learned that she was in the United States. And they got our number and they called us and they said, would it be possible before Jasmine goes back, could she fly to the East Coast and spend a week with our family? Because we've prayed for her and we've sponsored her since she was six year, seven years old. We've sponsored her. Could she come be with our family for a week? We called the orphanage, Tom and Connie, got permission there, made sure the visa was okay for her to go and meet the family on the East Coast. She went and met that family that had sponsored her since she was six. She was just graduating college, and that family invited Jasmine to come live with them and go to college on the East Coast. And today, Jasmine is in law school on the East Coast. I want you to know that, that I can't describe how awesome it is to get involved in the things of God. Things would be that we couldn't lay out. If we settle for our plans, if we settle for our ideas, then that's what we get and that's the best we get. If we start moving over into God and His plans and His purposes, He does things that are beyond our imagination, beyond things that we could think of, and, and, and we get to do things. In, in March, I get to go March the 19th, and be a part of a wedding between a young man who's from Colombia, a young woman from Guatemala, 
who have hearts for ministry. And over the past several years, I've been working with them, and we've been sending out young people all over Central America. And I get to go be a part of their wedding. And they've been doing that primarily out of Guatemala, but they're now going to be stationed in Colombia. And we're going to be working with them to get things set up in Colombia for them to be sending kids out of Colombia into South America, I guess, and hopefully into to Central America. But we're also going to be sending kids from Guatemala down there to be trained and sent out from there. And I could have never dreamed of getting to be involved in stuff like that and with seeing God work in the hearts and lives of young people. God has plans, church. Self-evaluation, spiritual evaluation. Where have you been? Where are you at? Where are you going? And to know that God is working in this world today. He is doing amazing things. It's real easy to read the newspaper and all this stuff and get caught up in the mess. But God is working. And He is setting the captives free. He's saving the lost. And He wants us to be involved with it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for how You love us. You're so patient, gracious with us. You meet us, Lord, right where we're at. (laughs) And that's awesome. And you love us. Lord, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. That is most certainly the gift that keeps on giving through the ages, through the years, and forever. And that we have salvation by faith in Jesus. We have forgiveness by the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. You have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Father God, let us never make something mundane or boring or lukewarm out of what you have done for us in Christ. Stir us by your spirit. Lead us forward into your kingdom purposes. And thank you that you are doing that in Jesus' holy, powerful name. All God's people said, amen. Today, if there's anybody that would like to join the church in our journey with us here uh, as a family of faith, I would let you know that you're welcome. We would love to have you do that if you're a baptized believer. I say that because there might be somebody here that wants to do that. I say that also. Some of you might know Linda Harrison, uh, but Linda came and joined this morning at the nine o'clock service. So if you'd give her a call, let her know we mentioned her. Uh, What a glorious thing, because it's been beautiful watching God connect her to this congregation. And uh, then another friend of hers will be doing that in the next week or so. Linda wasn't sure she was going to be here today, but when she was here, she said she was ready, wanted to do that. And God is working in this place. And he's speaking to our hearts, I hope even today, stirring your heart. Uh, He's an awesome God. He's loving, he's patient, he's kind. And he is a glorious God. Let us stand and sing our praise to him to close today. It's been a blessing worshiping with you today as we end 2021. And how about next week when we come to worship? We'll be in 2022 to know where we've been, 
Think of God to help us understand where we're at and by his spirit to lead us where he, is, he wants us to go. Take a moment, look around. Also, if you're watching online, we want you to know that you're included uh, in this as well. And uh, what a blessing to be a part of this family of faith. Who are we? We are Christ's family. And we have come to worship the Lord and to give him praise. Now we accept my God to be fully devoted to the of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the way you love us. We ask you now to lead us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. I pray you will be led by the Spirit in this day, in this week, and into this new year for the glory of God. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be blessed as you go today. Mm -hmm.